Isaiah 54. And we have a, don't we have a harvest party uh, the 14th? That's on a Friday. Friday the 14th of this month. It'll be here before you know it. And uh, that's always fun to, to participate in. Uh, it humbles you. If you have any pride, come to our harvest party and we'll deal with it. <laughs> and we'll deal with it. Amen. Amen. I still look at some of them pictures on my phone of with that mouth apparatus and I laugh. I just laugh. And, uh, so, you know, when you, when you don't smile much and you put one of those apparatuses in, you can't help but smile. And uh, that was just really good. That was really good. But uh, that'll be October the 14th. Isaiah 54, and I'll read from verse 11 and 12. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all the borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. I want to preach this morning on the thought, the afflicted, the afflicted. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being in your house. It's always good to be in church, Lord. Of all the things that we could be doing, Lord, we chose to be here this morning. I pray that, Father, that you would help me as I deliver this message, Lord, and the messages yet to come that will follow this one, that, Lord, you would be everything that we need you to be. Lord, we're um, a people that, uh, Lord, we have so many things going on in our lives, and, and Lord, uh, society and the economy, everything, Lord, doesn't, doesn't lacks in any way, shape, or form, Lord. It, it just doesn't. There it seems to be no reprieve. And then we have our own personal struggles and issues in our own lives. But I'm always reminded of the fact that, Lord, you do care for each and every one of us. You, you're concerned about my problems. You're concerned about their problems. The Bible says that you hold us as the apple of the eye. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that personableness that we can have with you. I pray that, Lord, you'd bless us as we elaborate on your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This is a series that I did 21 years ago. And I heard a man years ago preach on this, and, and uh, I was so impressed with it that 21 years ago I thought, well, I'm going to uh, preach it, and I, and I did, taught it. And um, I've been thinking about it for, for quite some time. I really have, and I've prayed about it. And the, the things that I'm going to be discussing here, they're, they're, they're extremely powerful. They really are. And so I hope that you can make it a matter of, of importance to come and listen to everything. You know, there's, there, there's things in the Bible that, that if you just normally read, you don't pick up on a lot of things and you just, don't see the symbolism and, and uh, the typology that, that, that's involved. And Scripture is just laden beautifully with, with typology. It, it simply is. And, and I love just getting in there and, and uh, mining away at it. And, and, you know, I try to read, um, you know, after certain rabbis, Jewish culture and so on to to try to get the, the real spirit of the scripture, of what's being said. 
and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It really is, and I and it, it's extremely beneficial spiritually to to you and I. If you would, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you would, you know, Isaiah chapter fifty three is is considered one of the hallmark chapters of of the Bible. Uh, it's a very prophetic chapter. It was written about or prophesied about 700 years before Jesus was born, thereabouts. And I think that Isaiah 53 is something that all believers should be acquainted with it's at some point in your, in your walk with the Lord. And uh, uh, what Isaiah 53 is, it describes in detail the mortal life that Christ would live here on this earth up until his crucifixion. I used to know that chapter... Uh, verbatim uh, forward and backwards and you could ask me what verse 13 was and I'd tell you or tw two and I'd tell you I just had it down and uh, a very powerful chapter the Jews who reject um, Jesus refuse to even read Isaiah uh, 53 in their synagogues in fact Isaiah 53 has been called the torture chamber of rabbis because they deny Jesus came as their Messiah. And as we uh, delve into chapter 54, it is no doubt a reference to Jerusalem while they are headed into captivity. The imagery throughout the chapter is that of Yahweh, the faithful husband, forgiving Israel, the unfaithful wife, restoring her to her home, and bestowing her with undeserved blessings. But we too, folks, as a church, we live in tumultuous times. We simply are. Our world is changing moment by moment. You think that you've heard it all, and tomorrow morning there's going to be something new. Uh, and before the day is over tomorrow, you'll hear something towards evening. There's so many things going on that it's really hard for a person to process it. What we thought was sure is not anymore. That's why it is imperative that we build upon no other foundation except that of Jesus Christ. Because he is the hope and our hope alone for the church. And always remember this, folks. I mean, if there's one thing that you'll ever capture or retain from what I say, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The first thing that I want us to look at here this morning are those who have affliction. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 29, the Bible says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Have you ever been around people that are always plagued with problems? Uh, I, I've been around people like that. I, I, I have down through the years. Just seemingly the proverbial cloud is always lingering over their, their head everywhere they walk. I know... Uh, uh, a pastor that is is kind of like that, and my heart goes out to them. They just seems like nothing, nothing ever uh, positive is happening in their life. He does keep a, a a good attitude about it, tries to anyway, but you know, just finances and and their children and 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 so on. There's there's just so many issues and it just. It, it just always something dark and gloomy going on in their life. But then there are those that, um, that when this type of life is going on over them, they're not so fortunate to be optimistic about it, but they're always whining and crying, you know, woe is me and, and, and so on. Uh, it keeps them up at night. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're tired, uh, run down, stressed out, and so on. In verse 30 of uh, Proverbs 23, it says, They that tarry long at the wine, they had go to seek mixed wine. 
Now, it, it, it's interesting here, and I'm, I'm not trying to get off track here. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll bring all this together here. But verse 30 talks about the wine and mixed wine. So the context is speaking about a drunkard. A drunkard. You know, and I've been around this kind of people. Matter of fact, as, as I shared a little bit in Sunday school this morning, I've been in the same boat. You might hear them say, I didn't do anything wrong. It just hit me. Uh, someone is always hurting them without any cause. Yeah, I was just minding my own business, and boom, you know, this happened to my life. And, uh, you know, or you, you get in an argument, or, you know, as a young guy growing up, you know, the, <laughs> maybe you had a, somebody mis, mistook you for somebody else, and they come up and T-boned you or something like that with a fist. And what was that for, man? I didn't do anything. And, and uh, you know, so uh, things seemingly happen in, in our lives, and we have no cause for why these things should happen. In verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Well, this is saying that wine puts something in your system like an adder. It poisons you like a serpent bite. Well, what does it affect? Number one, it affects your mind. Uh, snake poison will alter your mind. It simply will. People get delusional uh, when they get bit by a poisonous snake. When we lived in Sierra Leone, we lived around a lot of poisonous snakes and vipers and things like that. Uh, they were just everywhere. As a matter of fact, it's just a part of your life. You learn what you can do and what you can't do. And you actually learn how to deal with them, you know, when, when they're ag aggressive and things like that. Uh, it, it's rather interesting being introduced to that in, in their culture. Uh, alcohol will also control a person's uh, thinking. It'll uh, uh, affect their balance, uh, the perception uh, of how they see things. Often their speech is slurred. They're oblivious to pain. Uh, you've heard the, the old adage that it's almost impossible to kill a drunk. You know, a lot of times uh, when there's accidents, road accidents and things on weekends, uh, Friday, Saturday night or something like that, a lot of times they'll say that was a head-on and it was a man that was totally intoxicated or a woman it was totally intoxicated. They killed the people in the un in oncoming vehicle, but they themselves are fine because they were drunk. They just passed out or something. And so, you know, the when, when, when these kind of things are happening in our lives, it not only affects you, your uh, composure, but it also harms those that are close to you, such as your family and your friends. Now, in, in Mark chapter 16, it's an interesting scripture here. And once again, I'm just kind of taking some pieces of the puzzle. I'm moving them around on the table here, and then we're going to bring them together. In Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, And these signs shall follow them that believe in, in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So the thing that I want us to kind of pull out of this verse here is take up serpents and if they drink. I, for one, folks, do not believe that this is talking about these handling these things literally. I just simply don't. It's talking about problems. It's talking about circumstances and conditions that shape our lives. I believe it was Job that said, as, a, as sparks fly upward from a fire, so are the troubles of, of men. You know, you oftentimes when you're at a campfire and, and it's dark at night and you go to probe that fire a little bit to get it going and you see all the sparks going up into the, into the sky. Uh, and Job says, those sparks are, are a reminder, that's the troubles that man has that is born of a woman. 
And so I be, that's what I believe is being addressed here. When Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, they met the serpent. Now, now, now one of the, you know, perspective is everything. The Bible tells us that God gave them, um, he, he, he gave Adam and Eve the dominion over all the beasts of the field, over every creature. They were superior. They, they had everything at their fingertips. But the serpent came to the tree of knowledge, and their eyes looked at him, and when they saw this serpent, and it, you know, you and I, when we, when we think of a serpent or a snake or an adder or something like that, ooh, you know, and we, we run. But see, it wasn't that way with Adam and Eve. Matter of fact, if you look into the Hebrew and so on, it was really something that got their attention. It was something that was beautiful. This serpent was, was rather attractive to look upon, and especially to the fact that it spoke and so on. I believe it comes from the Hebrew word nakish, I believe. Um, but, you know, they, they saw this creature and they saw this fruit, you know, be it grapes or a mango or an apple or whatever it was, you know, but they saw the fruit and they saw that it was, it was desirable. And uh, as they were in this, this situation with this uh, serpent, when they heard the serpent's voice, they, they heard it. They listened to it. And what they were doing, in essence, was drinking it in with their eyes and their ears. In other words, they were paying attention. They were paying attention to what this serpent was, was saying to them, the way that he was making his move. And, and maybe he was just kind of moving around, slithering around the tree, you know, uh, our imagination can only, you know, just go on and on and, and, and talking to them and, and so on. And, and, and they're starting to pay attention to this and so on. But, but in the end, in the end of, of this narrative in, in Genesis, it bit them like an adder and poisoned them. Not the serpent, but what he was saying what they were paying attention to, what they were listening to, what they were seeing, that's what bit them. And the Bible says they were removed from the presence of the Lord. From that moment forward, life has never been the same on this planet. The serpent and drinking is not talking about literal snakes like they might handle in the southern churches. I I read about that every once in a while in, in the, the newspaper where a church in Kentucky or something, they were handling snakes and somebody was killed because it bit them. I've, I've heard that they, they'll, they'll pull these snakes out. And once again, folks, I've never been in a service like that. And if you brought out a snake, I'll tell you what, you and I is going to have words because I'm going to find a door where there ain't no door. I'm going to look for a window where they're in the window, and I'm going to get out of this place. And then you and I is going to have words. I just, I'm just not into that stuff. And, uh, but they say they bring these snakes out, and they'll start handling them. And if you get bit by one, you know, and, it, it, uh, and if you get sick, that means you got sin in your life and things like that. And I thought, man, how dumb, you know. And, uh, but, you know, people do that. Even today in 2022, people still do that kind of stuff. It, it just happens, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't yield to that. I, I th this is not uh, what it's talking about. Nor does this scripture in John or Math or Mark sixteen reference taking up poison and drinking it to to test the power of God. You know, I don't, I don't believe that either. Uh, I when we lived in Africa, I drank some things that that um, that. I, that were pretty questionable. And I just, while I drank it, while others were drinking, of course, you know, when you're in the bush, in the deep bush, where they got mud huts and thatch roofs, and, and uh, I mean, their immune system is like bulletproof, and, you know, and mine's not. And, and they pass around, you know, you're eating out of a headpan, and, and they pass around a communal cup, you know, where there's <laughs> water that where they got it, I don't know, but, but they pass it around, you know, and everybody drinks out of the same cup. And, and I'm just in my mind, I'm going, Lord, uh, just 
sanctify this. <laughs> you know, don't let me get sick from it. You know, I, I think that's a circumstance that, that, that could be applicable to this, this narrative here. And, uh, but, but deliberately taking poison and saying, hey, it isn't going to hurt me. You know, I'm going to show the power of God. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that at all. But what this scripture is saying, that it does matter what you see and what you hear. It does matter what you expose yourself to, what you are taking in in your everyday life. You have to be careful to what you listen to, you know, what you see, because it can poison you. It simply can. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Uh, Hollywood has done a, 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 I want to say a phenomenal slash horrendous job of portraying wickedness. And people will, will watch some of these things and then they wonder why it's, it's, it's repeated in our society down the road because they learn this and, and so on. They listen to it. They watch it. And before long, you, you see this, this type of behavior, uh, not only uh, in our streets, but we see it in our schools and so on, where these people, I, I know a guy personally where his children were, I, were murdered. I, I know this personally. And, uh, and he told, told the story. And they caught the guy that murdered his kids. And he thought that he was a Hollywood producer, director, because he had the same name and he made these gore films. And so he went, you know, kind of like a retribution. He went back and he got his kids and, and killed some of them. Uh, it, it was a horrible thing, but, but it, it's, you know, once again, it's, it's looking at these things that in the movies, and I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, the big thing, of course, you know, I, when, I, when I was growing up, we had three channels, 16, 22, and 28, <laughs> and you had rabbit ears on top of your, your TV, and, and you had to, you know, us kids would hold it so dad could watch it, you know, that type of thing, and, and uh, the big thing back there was, when, when Walt Disney, you know, Disney World, Disney came out, you know, in, in living color. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'd watch the FBI with Ephraim Zimelis Jr., you know, in living color. And, uh, you know, th things were so, so, so different. Hollywood was so different back then. Of course, you know, that was just the opening of the, uh, of the, of the door, you know, to, for, for bigger and, and worse things yet to come. And but but now today, folks, there's things that are that, that that they show on on TV and in the movies that are you know demonization, uh, they where demons are glorified and 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 put up in the limelight and and all these things. It, it, it's terrible. It's terrible what 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 children are exposed to today. You know, adults are are one thing, but. Innocent children being exposed to a steady diet of this is terrible. Well, well, let, let, let's move Hollywood aside. You all know what I'm talking about there. The, the, the other thing that doesn't seem so bad, but it really is bad, and that's just our daily news. I mean, we, we, we live in an hour where, folks, I, I, you know, and I'm a newsman. I, I, I really am. I, I, I try to bend an ear to it. I try to bend my ear to, now this is oxymoronic, but. Good news, <laughs> you know. I I try to find it, and uh, and and I believe there is some that out there that are that are trying that do give some some good news, but but even in the good news, it's bad news because it just blows your mind what's going on all, all across our, our 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 planet. It's almost like a Cold War tactic. The more you see and the more you listen to, the more it gets you down and the more it creates fear in your life. And you just think, wow, there's no, there's no need to keep moving forward because everything is so bad. Maybe I'm the only one that sees that or hears that. It's, it's, it's what we have as life today. That's almost the norm for life today. 
you know, and, and if you're not careful, we'll dwell on those things and, and we'll share those things. And, and I'm not saying talking about it is wrong. That's not my point. But allowing it to get the best of us is, is, is what I'm addressing here. When your mind becomes affected, the end result is that you are full of woe and sorrow. And it doesn't look good for us. It simply doesn't. Let me, let me give you some common practical applications here. <laughs> oh, you got to love me. You know, some wives, and, and I'm not saying this is in our church, okay? I, I don't believe it is. But I've, I've seen it, I've listened to it, I've counseled it. But some wives and, and with their children, they listen to a drunken husband or father come home at night. He comes home, he slams the door, he starts yelling, he wrecked the car, he curses, cusses. I, I knew a guy like this. I, I did his funeral here a couple years ago. His, his dad would, would, would get his paycheck and he would go to the bar and he'd spend it all throughout the week on, on staying drunk. He stayed in a drunken stupor. And then on Friday, he'd get paid again. He'd go and pay last week's bill and start again. And JR said that he would beat my mom. He'd beat her. One day, JR said, Dad, I've had enough. And he went and grabbed his dad like he was going to waylay him. And his dad just grabbed him by the neck, threw him out the front door. JR said, I was laying on my back, and my dad was over me just getting ready to hit me, and his dad started crying and ran off. You see, that, has a, that type of environment has, a, has an effect, a negative effect on, on a mother, on a, on a wife, and on the children. You know, they, 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 they live with that. He, here he is, 70 years old, telling me this story. He's getting ready to die. J.R. is. And yet, he's telling me how he was raised as a, a young boy. Let me just sew this in for his dad. I'm not making an excuse for his dad, but this is the difference between men back then and men today. His dad was a survivor on the beach of Normandy. And they didn't talk about it back then. They just tried to drink it under the table. That's how they, they dealt with it back then. Today, it's all glamorized and so on. And, but the men of old back in World War I, World War II, they didn't, they didn't talk about it. There was nothing pretty about it. It was something that, that haunted them, and they didn't know how to deal with it. And J.R. grew up in that, in that atmosphere. And he, he, here's the thing that I'm trying to, to, to get across. It, it has an impact on that wife and it has an impact on those children for the, for the rest of their life. And they never themselves touch a drop of alcohol. But they saw it. and They heard it. That's all it takes, just like Adam and Eve. They saw it and they heard it. And life was never the same. As a Christian, you can take up the serpent. You can take up adverse circumstances, folks, today in Jesus' name, and you can go right through them. You don't have to allow circumstances today to control you. You can control them. Amen. Again, Adam and Eve had the power to make the, the serpent leave because they had dominion over every living creature. But see, you and I don't. We don't. If there was a snake in here, once again, folks, I tell you what, uh, I think we'd all be pushing and shoving to get out the door first. Amen. Well, let's look at the, in the home. Again, you know, you take a husband and wife that doesn't get along because of her moodiness. 
And, 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 and let me just say, you know, the monthly moodiness. That, and in the mind, and, and, and I know what I'm talking about here, not experientially, but from what I've counseled people with. The husband can't handle it. The wife can't handle it. And so he's upset with the wife and, and the children. It, it's the innocent children that listen to all this going on, all this rhetoric, all this ungodly communication that's going on between mom and dad. And they watch and they listen. And every month it's the same thing over and over and over again. You take a husband that goes out and he works hard all week and doesn't make the money that he thinks he should be making because of his skills and maybe because of the economy, you know, gas prices are going up, fuel prices are crazy. You know, we filled up two of our trucks last week, just last week, John, filled up two of our trucks and it was $1,700 to fill up both of my trucks. $1,700. You got an extra offering plate here. <laughs> $1,700. But you, you, you take the husband. He, he has all this stress and pressure. You, you got a mortgage. You got uh, a grocery bill. You got this, that, and the other. Doctor bill or whatever, you know. You can't see the doctor because you don't have the money to see the doctor. And, and you know, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And... The, the dad, and I'm not making excuses for dads or husbands or fathers. I, I'm just not. But under this stress, they, they, they fly off the handle at the wife. They fly off the handle at the kids. All is seen and it's all heard. And then children, as they grow up, they pick up the moods that mom and dad have as they grow up. You know, I've heard it said, I, I believe it was Dr. David Jeremiah said years ago that it's a proven fact that if you're raised, if a child is raised in an alcoholic environment where they have an alcoholic father or an abusive father, nine times out of ten, they'll marry somebody just like their father. Well, let's, let, let's, let's bring it into the church here. People watch other people in the church. It's kind of a blessing when you have a small church like this because we know everything about each other. <laughs> yeah, but we watch each other. And, and, and folks, that, I, you know, they, I've always said the pastor's always the last one to find things out, but I really don't, I don't you know, I, I'm thankful for our church. I really am. I think we have a beautiful group of people here. I do, and I'm not just saying that I don't believe in flattery. I believe in honesty. And uh, I, I, I just love each and every one of you dearly. But in other bigger churches, it's not quite that way. People go in and they're constantly looking at other people and how they live. Uh, and they, they, the end uh, result is that they get fed up. Uh, well, if so-and-so is in church and they're singing and they're doing this and I'm their neighbor, man, you, you, I know what he did this week. I seen him cussing at his, his wife and he's up there leading songs and so on and playing the guitar and all. Yeah, I see all that stuff. You know, and before you know it, boom, they, they got bit and they're out of the church because they can't, they can't handle it. And out from the presence of the Lord, they go. Now, Isaiah 54 and 11 in our text, it says, you are afflicted and cannot recover. You're afflicted and not comforted is what the text says. Too many people are drunk with the problems and circumstances that surround their lives, just like today. But listen to what the scripture says. Again, in Mark 16, it says, you will take up serpents, and if you drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt you in Jesus' name. And I, I believe there's an, there's an order here in Mark chapter 16, and it starts clear back in, in, in verse 15 through 18. Number one, you get Jesus in your life. Accept him as your personal savior. 
Amen. Get him in your life. Uh, that's first and foremost. Get rid of the devil and everything that you had with the devil prior to that. Get full of the Holy Ghost. Watch out what you see. Watch out what you listen to. Then and only then can you do like Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We don't see a lot of things going on in our church positive because everybody's living such a mixed up life. They're afflicted and tossed about. They're not comforted. James says that, that you are to pray for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But here, 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 here's, the, here's the point. Don't ask me to come and pray for you when you're seeing and listening to stuff that isn't conducive to your Christianity. It's not going to work. In Isaiah 54, 11, the prophet says, tossed with tempest. It means to disperse, drive away, to rush upon like a fearful whirlwind. If you watch and listen to these things, folks, you're just tossed about. You look for promise and you get nothing but disappointment in return. You can't even find comfort. But what does God say about his people? <laughs> just keep reading on, folks, because Isaiah assures us that God is right here because he says, behold, behold. In other words, look up, look out and see what God has right before our eyes. Remember, perspective is everything. It's everything. Keeping your perspective clear and your focus right. And you talk about people that have been tossed about. My, look at what happened in Florida this past week. My. You know, I've, I've watched so many video clips and seen pictures of the devastation there. You know, they said there's one place there where the, the sand went in inland one mile and is three feet deep. Fort Myers, 90% of Fort Myers is just doesn't exist anymore. You know, when he says tossed about with tempest, that's, that's where my mind goes. These people were... I mean, they're just shaking like a rag in the wind. Well, the, the, the prophet goes on, and he talks about this foundation of walls in verse 11 and, and 12. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, he says, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires and I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all the, thy borders of pleasant stones. All these have meaning. And this, once again, this is where I was alluding to earlier that we read over a lot of things and we don't understand the profundity of what really is deep beneath the surface here. And uh, so... When we, when we look into this, now, this is where our, our series is going to take us, and you're just thinking, how is this going to be applicable? But the high priest in the Old Testament, when the high priest, high priest he was adorned with a garment, and, you know, he had his crown, he had his ephod, and he had his, his, every, his linen breeches, everything. But on the, the chest of that high priest was what they called a breastplate. And that breastplate had 12 different stones, colored stones on his breastplate. And these stones suggest they're a typology of the qualities and character traits for you and me that we can have. When times are difficult. He says you have borders. I'm, and I'll just give you a, 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 a gist of, of what we're going to be talking about. Borders, boundary limits, landmarks. 
Borders suggest our interactions and our dealings with others. Did you know the, bo- the borders or the boundaries that you have in your life define who you are? They, they do. I have, I have boundaries in my life. There's just certain things I refuse to do. There's certain things that I refuse other people to come into in my life because I have boundaries. That's my identity. Amen. They who have no boundaries are, are driven uh, and tossed like the waves on the sea. Amen. So we, we need borders. And, and God says that I've given you borders. He says, I've given you stones. Stones is plural. God is going to put many stones around you. Stones are a vital part of any foundation. Of course, today we have concrete and so on. But back then, stones was something that was very critical. The headstone, the cornerstone, you know, uh, uh, footer stones and things like this. Stones are e- e- extremely important uh, in construction, but there, God is saying they're extremely important for your life to have a foundation. I've given you stones, colorful stones. When we get to heaven, we'll see all these stones. And God is trying to build around you, the Bible says, pleasant stones. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 4, For our other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. He goes on, he talks about the borders, the stones, and then he talks about the, thy windows. A window is used for protection, but they are mainly used for allowing light into the room. You and I are supposed to be something that people can see through, see something positive through. You and I are supposed to keep the right perspective. You know, we're living in such a, a dismal hour, folks. When people ask questions, do you give them the right answers? I like what Brother Zane said. It, this was so huge. Somebody walked up to him and said, man, our world's pretty messed up, isn't it? Brother Zane said, your world might be, but not mine. <laughs> you see, it's all about perspective. We're just passing through. My world's up there. Hey, Amen. your world may be messed up, but not mine. Well, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you. Amen. Gates represent what we allow in and out of our lives. Now, this breastplate, and I'm going to wind down with this. In Exodus chapter 28, let me just turn there. In Exodus chapter 28, in verse 29, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart, when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. This breastplate was something that Aaron had to wear. It wasn't optional. He had to wear it in order to go into the holy place where God's presence was. And God used these precious stones clear back in the beginning with the high priest. And like everything else God uses, there is a purpose for it. And we need to understand that. God has a purpose for everything. These 12 stones represent the 12 stones or the 12 tribes of Israel that were close to his heart. In Exodus 28, the Bible says that it is a fine work. It's not something that was just thrown together on a piece of metal and put, he wore it. It was a, it was a detailed work. The Bible says that Job, Job had a hedge, borders around his life. Amen. He was protected when the devil went before the Lord, before God, and said, hey, you know, you, you've given Job, you've spoiled him, you've let him have everything in his life. And God said, you're wrong. You're wrong. And the devil says, let me have him. I'm giving you Metzger's paraphrase here. I can make him curse you. God says, all right, go for it. 
but there's a hedge around him and you can't take his life. You see, God was protecting him. And, and we all know the story of Job. Job won out in the end. Job never cursed God. He never, he never got beside himself. I mean, and God restored to him more in the end than he had in the beginning. And Job was one of the wealthiest men in the Bible at, at that time, if not ever. But it, God protected him. And the Bible tells you and I in Colossians 3.3 3, that your life is hid in Christ. We have such a protected protection around you and I. We don't have to lose sleep over what's going on outside. We simply don't because God has, has laid around us a foundation of precious stones for our protection. You know, the, you know, the, uh, I like to look at it this way. You know, I, I, I've got a, a, a picture of my wife and I pulled down off my wall in my office. And, uh, you know, it just, we had a Valentine banquet and I pulled it, you know, but I can show this up to you and everybody can see it and the devil sees it and everybody else sees it, you know. But when I throw it in here, put it in my Bible and shut it up, Amen, it's different. God knows it's there and I know it's there. Amen, it's protected. God has a protection for you and I if we could just understand it. Laying these precious stones around you is for your protection. They were placed according to their tribes, not according to the genealogy, because genealogies were placed on the onyx stones that he had on his, on his shoulders. And um, the priest uh, carried them there, but here it was totally different. It was their, their names. Well, where, where, where are we going with this, the afflicted? What I want to show to you here, you know, from in, in, in the next week and some of the weeks to come, is God has done so, so much for you and I as a believer. He's given us so much if we could just see it. And I believe this is really applicable for today because of the things that are going on out there. I mean, there's a lot of hateful speech going on out there. I mean, I, mean, I, could, I could go off here and, you know, Folks, we don't know if we're going to be in a nuclear war tomorrow or not. We don't know if we're going to get a nuke on our lap here tomorrow or not. I'm, I'm just being open with you. I see. I, 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 I seen a news clip where it shows. It shows seven nuclear planes with nuclear bombs that Russia has moved. You know, what are you trying to do here? I'm, I'm trying to, no, I'm not trying to scare you, but that's the hour that we're living in. They are locked and loaded. From Saturday, I'll tell you the ones who, who, who discovered, and that was the Israeli Secret Service with their satellite imagery. They found them. They know right where they're at. They're locked and loaded. Am I losing sleep over it? No, not in any way, shape, or form. I'm concerned about it. I sure am. But we live in an, in an hour, folks, where we don't know what's going to happen. We, we simply don't. Look at the morality in our, as Nathan brought up this morning in Sunday school, look at the morality in our, in our country. Look at the morality in our uh, school system. It's, it's appalling. The cross-gender lifestyles that are being pushed into people's lives, into children. But God has us. You're not just wandering around aimlessly here, and you have to understand that. He says, behold, look up. God has your back. He has your front. <laughs> Amen. Hannah, if you'd come to the piano this morning. As we open up this altar, keep in mind that Isaiah's words are, are timeless. We too can draw from these promises and gather the resources 
that God has given to us in these difficult and uncertain times that we're living in today. God has everything that we need. Let me let you in on a little secret here. <laughs> this has not taken God by surprise. <laughs> Man, he knows exactly. He's got our route already established. He's got the message just for you. He's if, if we'll just listen. He's got it all planned out. When you get to this juncture, be it as a country, as a state, globally, just me as a person. He's got your route all plotted out. If we'll just listen. Amen. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everything, God, that you do for us. Lord, my mind goes back to roughly 2,700 years ago when Isaiah spoke these words. 2,700 years ago, and, and they have just as much emphasis, just as much force upon our lives today as they did 2,000 years ago when Jesus was here. Lord, help us to understand this. Make it revelatory to us. We're not down and out. We're, we're not. The admonition is, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Lord, that's what we're supposed to be looking at. Looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, that's where my hope's at. <laughs> Help me to see it, Lord, and strive for it. Lord, you see each and every individual here. Lord, I don't know what goes on in in the personal lives of, of these folks here? I, I don't. But Lord, you see it. You see everything that they're struggling with. You see the affliction, the lack of comfort. There are the absence of it. You see it all. You read our lives like an open book. You simply do, but that's, that's good. That's the ministry of of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us, Lord, to understand that, to understand that and help us, Lord, to, to give you that place in our life that needs you. <laughs> it's not gonna get any easier. It can only get better. We love and appreciate you, Father. Thank you so much for being our God. In Jesus' name. The altar's open. You're welcome to come and pray. Praying.